So today, basically I want to run through how we're trying to change the way we engage with design. Uh, so trying to create engagement both digital and through tactile experiences. Uh, I'll cover a number of all these software, uh, the sort of platforms I've worked with, and uh, covering things like recap and remake, um, and VR and AR through 3ds Max, and starting to explore the Stanley game engine. And how uh, Fusion 360, which uh, usually wouldn't be associated with the engineering part here because it's you know, more of a product design program, uh, but how we're able to use it to mainly for 3D printing, but um, to be able to use it to cross boundaries uh, and help explain technical knowledge. So, where did it sort of start for me? Um, Back in 2004, um, I started out as my first job in the ABC industry. Um, they gave me a computer and bought it there. Um, and that was it. Um, come forward to 2016, and my hardware setup now is, is certainly grown. Um, but everything from mobile computers, um, iPads, iPhones, um, VR and AR equipment, drones. Uh, little microcontrollers from the likes of Raspberry Pi and Arduino, and also high resolution sort of portable little cameras like GoPro and also uh, 3D printers as well. Now, on the software side, that's certainly growing as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that, these are just the ones I can put on this page. So, uh, the problem I still have though, when I look across the industry, is even though we have all this equipment, all the software, a lot of the people I see are generally still just using maybe one or two pieces of software and pretty much just straight out of the box. They're, they're not trying to look for any other alternatives or how to use it other than how it was prescribed to them. <coughs> so, over the years, I've, I've sort of grown frustrated with that kind of just everyone basically approached everything that that's the way we've done it and that's the way we're going to do it. Um, so I sort of looked at it and tried to break it down into three areas that I wanted to try and change. Um, the first one, how do we capture information? And that can be just capturing existing data, what models are already out there, what they already got, um, photos of sites, um, standard surveying techniques, so uh, laser scanning and Uh, and then, how do we experience that data once we've got it? Uh, and by experience, I sort of mean, how do we, what do we experience as we go through that process of the design? Uh, what do we do with it? Uh, how can we build upon it? How can we run simulations with that data? Create visualizations or even just build something from it? Uh, and then, the next step is, how can we engage with that data? How do we engage with those designs? Uh, so going beyond the screen or beyond 2D paper plans. <coughs> so, back in 2004, 2005, um, I was getting pretty frustrated with this idea that we'd, we'd throw up those plans, <coughs> some of them made a change, we'd have to redraw everything again. Um, everything's still pretty much in 2D. Uh, the Liverpool's obviously still just 2D paper plans. So I started exploring some alternatives. Uh, so 
we had this we had this house project come up. Uh, it was quite a big thing to start. So I decided to go all out and, and AutoCAD model the entire thing. Um, every piece of steel work, all the concrete, every single bolt, um, even reinforcing. Um, my computer certainly hated me for it. Um, it. It was a lot of work, but it, it felt like I was finally getting somewhere. I was going beyond this whole 2D world that we were stuck in. Fortunately, um, Reddit came along for us, so I didn't have to do all that manual work anymore. Um, so we were able to change and then the sort of evolve into that. So I kind of felt like I, I got somewhere. Um, I'd gone from just what we did and I started moving forward. <coughs> now, around that same time, um, we acquired a transportation company. Um, so they was doing a lot of traffic simulation. Um, and they, they ended up sitting within my line of sight. So I'd sit there with my done 2D plans and now my 3D models, which were still done but in static. And I'd watch their screens and they were, they were organic, they were alive, there was things happening, there was simulations of vehicles all moving. So I got talking to them now and they were still, they were, even though it was alive, they were still stuck in this 2D world and they wanted to know how could we sort of blend the two together. So we started exploring some alternatives and <coughs> I came across this piece of software that was uh, it's an artificial intelligence package that was designed for the movie industry and it allowed us to start doing things like simulating the movement of people and at the time pedestrian simulation was, was more of a chessboard game system where if, if this square is empty I'll move to that square um, and this was the first time we were able to create like an organic sort of simulation where each one has their own brain each one has their own desires, and they all uh, use visual and audio cues, and they're able to move around and avoid each other. So we're certainly moving forward. I've, just, I've gone from 2D to 3D, and now to bringing things to life. Um, but this was still 2D in theory. So <laughs> just, these people just had to move along the ground. So I thought, well, how can we, how can we explore a 3D environment? So I, I, I decided to try and simulate birds instead. So given that they had a full 3D environment, they were able to move around. Um, so in this simulation here, um, I set up three different species of birds. Each one has a preference of the altitude they like to fly at. And they will follow each other and flock together based on visual cues. Uh, and you'll see, so I'll speed it up for a second. Um, you see how they finally start separating into their desired groups. And then the other thing you'll notice is the green ones, occasionally they'll dive to the ground. Uh, now I still don't really know exactly why that was happening because we didn't program that into them. Um, we just basically gave them their desires. Um, and all it was was just a few of them decided to break off um, and then they follow each other and once they get to the ground they realise that they prefer to be with the block and they take off back up. So, so we're finally getting somewhere. We, we really were able to 3D um, create three environments where we simulate a 3D environment. And <coughs> back at that time, um, we still couldn't really simulate vehicles and pedestrians in a single model. Um, there was a few options out there, but nothing really, uh, nothing that was really organic and provided a true representation of what goes on. So, combining these, we're able to simulate. So this is a train and bus station. So, <coughs> buses you see coming along the top, and trains through the middle. <coughs> now, the buses have got their own brain, they're basically the autonomous agents. Um, and it follows the people and the trains. And you'll pretty soon get to see just how organic it is and in fact the, the buses really try and push the way through the pedestrian um, which is not a simulation package is that if you're too rules based you basically let it stop until it's clear. Um, so this is great, we could really simulate nature. Um, the problem is the industry which wants industry industry standard software um, and we were we've gone beyond that. It was almost too natural. Um, 
So we, we used some number of projects, but we, we didn't really go much further with it. Um, so we got to this point and we'd, we hired a meteorologist uh, as part of some wind farm projects that we were doing. And I got talking to him about um, the fact that we can now simulate nature, uh, we can simulate all these three environments. And <coughs> what we do as far as taking his knowledge of the weather and integrate the two together. So we started looking at how we can blend CFT analysis, so the wind flow to a city with things like uh, direct sunlight, uh, humidity, ambient temperatures, uh, and we are able to calculate what we came up with was the, the comfort value. So we can start predicting the comfort values around certain areas of the city. And that way, the new precinct designs, the new restaurant areas, we can start predicting, is it going to be a comfortable environment to sit in? <coughs> so, basically we have to take the Revit software, uh, the models that we have, we blend it with the CFD and we're going to be able to export out a 3D Max or a Revit model to basically show what areas are comfortable. Now, this, this took a lot of manual labor though, um, and <coughs> at the same time, I've been experimenting with Dynamo, uh, which may have heard of the computational design package. Uh, this was back in the very early days of it. Uh, and <coughs> That initial workflow was around eight hours for both of us. Um, for Dynamo, uh, it was about eight seconds. Uh, we basically pulls all the information, <coughs> in, regenerates it all, simulates it, and then spits it out for both Revit and 3 d Max, ready to visualize. Uh, and just to show you an example of it in action, we, <coughs> we ended up pulling out the urban comfort store. also told me, don't show me anything fancy. I just want something simple, cheap, so that we can just play on the video. So we brought them in and we showed them this. And they said, yeah, that would be fine. <coughs> but I said, well, I've got you here now, so <coughs> we'll put them in 3ds Max, we'll create a visualization, and it's, it's a bit of an experience. But what if we create a gaming experience? What if we could actually train the drivers to use the facility? <coughs> so, from under the desk, I pulled out an Oculus and a steering wheel and some pedals. And I said, while you're here, just try it on. Um, and this is it here. This is, I mean, we just put together a few hours, basically. Um, it was because we already had the models, it was quite simple to drag and drop them into the game engine. Is an off-the-shelf driving simulator. <coughs> and within a few seconds of using it, um, he basically just said how much and when can we get it. Um, so he came off and saying, nothing fancy, just simple to completely change, but the fact that it's just 
creating an engaging environment for them to, to experience. <coughs> so, uh, more recently, uh, we've been working with, the, with an airport that is that seems like an existing terminal, but they're looking at changing to the self-service e-passport systems. So our visualization team has gone out and <coughs> But again, that's just a visual experience. So what if we could gamify that as well? So this time we're using the Alpha HTC Vive system. <coughs> we're able to put them in there and have them explore the whole system, walk through it, understand what it's, what it's like. And this is all giving the clients and the stakeholders the ability to actually engage with the data. They don't have to just come back to us and say, hey, can you make these signs of the model think we have another visualization? We just hand it to them. They can go into the model and start playing around with it. <coughs> so, so far, I've had the pre existing digital data that we've got. So, uh, three models that we already have available to us. So, I wanted to start exploring more of how do we really capture the environment? But we don't have that data already. So, <coughs> this was another project. Uh, this is the Crashy Chart Gallery. And this was a simulation I did to help explain what happened in the earthquake with the ground signal, uh, which is seems quite significant. Now, this building is going to be required to be lifted so that they can base isolate the whole foundation system, which means the whole building services systems, all the pipework, in the placement is all going to have to be disconnected and then reconnected once they've lifted the building. Um, now, we didn't actually have any plans uh, of any of that. So, they said, how can we go in and how can we capture all this? Now, we've just recently been using laser scanners to laser scan all the churches that were damaged in the earthquakes. However, the scans were amazing, but at that time we couldn't do anything. We didn't have tools like Recap and uh, Revit couldn't handle point clouds the way it came out. So they looked amazing, but they were almost useless to us. We really had to strip them down to just pure sections to get any information out. So instead, um, I've already been testing out some of the technology from all of this around the camp recap. So I said, let's go down to the basement, grab a camera, and let's just take some photos and see it. And from that, we're able to 
okay, three miles of the old firewood network in the sink, and then integrate that to it. Uh, the beauty of this is uh, we already charged for six weeks' work because they decided it was going to take that long. Uh, we did this in a couple of hours. <laughs> so it really it must have been on the summer. So our geotechnical team saw what we did here and they had thousands of sites across the hills in Christchurch where they had to go and assess the containment those. So we went out to the sand, uh, just all ground based camera <coughs> work, just capturing these sites and creating these models, uh, which we could then post on the cloud and then share straight to the client so they could get a link, open them up, check them out. But then, and then it came to this site. So this site here is about 14 acres. Um, we have a cliff along the top there. Um, that was all houses before the earthquake. Um, they all collapsed over the cliff edge. Um, you can see all these shipping containers along the bottom. That's to protect the road and all the potential further rock falls that have happened over the years. Um, and our job is to monitor this whole site, but also plan was to remove <coughs> the rest of these houses here and bench that whole thing back to make it safe. Um, and at the same time, this whole bottom area had to be reshaped so that there would be a nice catch trench for any further rock fall. So initially there's there's still quite a few dangerous rock areas around here. And every time we had another after shot there was potentially more more rocks we were going to pull out. Um, so at the time, uh, the only real solution was app um, They're very expensive. Uh, it can be up to $40,000 for a day uh, to have them uh, go and assess some of the rocks. Uh, so in the background, I've been working with some UAVs, some drones, and said, why don't we try that instead? So instead of the $40,000, uh, in 15 minutes, we could be out there with this flying checking out all these dangerous rocks and seeing whether or not they need to be uh, brought out. <coughs> so now, now we have this capability to capture data uh, and also drones, so why not blend them together obviously. So as I mentioned, we had to create this catch trench for any further rock fall. <coughs> but um, to figure out where this safe line is that people can operate and where that catch trench should be, uh, we have to run these rock fall simulations. So using Remap, very quickly find the site, generate three model. And then cut all the section line between and then export that through to our rock fall simulation software. Uh, we're able to turn this around in a day, uh, which the clients were just not <coughs> <coughs> Every week, as they were changing that catch trench, we were able to fly again, provide them an updated safe zone as to where people can operate. And yeah, from then on, they just wanted us flying almost daily. <coughs> now, the problem with drone based photogrammetry, um, it doesn't always work. Uh, this is one of our first attempts at the site, uh, certainly not usable. Um, the reason for that, when you're a drone pilot, there's a lot going through your head. Um, you're monitoring everything from the altitude and airspeed, um, the distance from the ground because of the, the focal length of the camera and the overlap of the images. Um, then you've got things like birds to watch out for. Um, this was by the sea, so there were seagulls constantly kind of <laughs> swooping down at the drone. Um, other aircraft, there's quite a lot of helicopters in this area. Then there's things like turbulence, because it was at the sea, there's a lot of wind coming off the ocean, hitting that, uh, that, that base was 200 feet high, so there's a lot of turbulence coming up and over that edge. Now, uh, even things like bees, bees just seem to love drones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the amount of times we've been we found like leftover bits of a bee. Uh, and then things like battery life, obviously, uh, a line of sight. Uh, it's certainly important on a site like this where you've got a big cliff in your way. Um, and then things like dogs and public. Someone could have to fly from out in public areas to be able to get a good line of sight. 
and the amount of times that people see someone fly a drone and just want to come talk to you. <laughs> <coughs> so we solve this some of these things by simply having a, a co-pilot, uh, so they can deal with the public and the jobs, and they can watch the battery life and the bees and birds and everything. However, you just you're still stuck trying to figure everything out. So when you're flying. This is an example that that site, and these are the areas that I've taken photos of. This is the mental map you're trying to keep in your head when you fly. Uh, and it's, it's clearly huge open gaps where maybe I should have got some more here. Uh, maybe it's just far too many things, it's just a waste of time. So, what if you remove the people from this and you create an autonomous flight system? So, there's, there's loads of uh, automated flight planners out there, uh, and they can solve some of this. But you can't exactly get rid of all the people. You still need people involved for health and safety. So. Now the problem is most of these flight planning systems are only really suited to either a flat open site or a very simple building. So flat open sites, they simply fly back and forth on a very easy pattern. Or for a building, that's really just an orbit pattern. Uh, there's nothing intelligent really about the way they so, for our site um, and for some of the other buildings we're going to do, neither of these would work. Uh, that cliff, as I said, it's 200 feet high, uh, a lot of change in validation. Uh, we had to get shots looking into the cliff as well as down on the cliff. Um, so, you can <coughs> manually program a flight plan like that, but it would take hours and it's not necessarily going to work. So, instead, in fact, the dynamo, the computational package, and said, what if you could instead create a very simple representation of the site you want to capture? So create a very basic model, then highlight the areas that you want to actually capture. <coughs> and then let the computational software figure out exactly where the best location is to get those images. And then link them all together and create a flight path. And then simulate that movement. So this in action. And the results and models that we now get. Which is still an improvement. And we could have stopped there. Um, there's certainly more than we need for the type of work that we're doing on this site. Um, we're, doing, we're doing volume calculations. Uh, that level of detail was plenty. But we thought, well, why stop there? Let's, let's see where we can go. So, standard 3 hour solos works with a GoPro. Um, they have released a system that uh, will have a higher resolution Sony camera but they're not looking at somehow as an individual piece. So for those of us that already have the drone, then we couldn't add that on. So instead, I've got my own high resolution camera, a 24 megapixel Sony, and I said, well, Fusion 360, the product that I'm having, finally integrate using that and 3D printers, and let's create our own mounts. So in Fusion, I was able to design them out to fit, uh, simulate it, and make sure it fits the standard movements that the extra weight of the camera. And then 3D printed. Um, and the difference we're now getting, so that's that site. If we zoom in to that little area in red, this was with the GoPro previously. <coughs> and that's what the same. Now, so for those of you that know much about photogrammetry and everything in the video, what we're now achieving. Uh, it's, it's called ground sampling distance, which is the distance on the ground between the pixels, uh, which we're now getting below a centimeter. Um, and the, the average error across the site, which is 40 meters, uh, we've got down to 20 millimeters, uh, which is very comparable to laser scanning. <coughs> so, what do we do with that data once we've got it? Um, 
so we can run through the cab generating mesh and remake and then we can start using it to overlay a surface area or uh, run through AutoCAD uh, sorry that should be a civil theory um, to do the volume calculations or section analysis for those rock <coughs> and just to give you a little example of how quick and easy it is to use remake when we had to do these section analysis, we had to make sure we remove things like vehicles, which we obviously don't want in there. Uh, we can quickly go in and remove them. And then you know, things like once the contractors have put down this mesh, uh, how do we go and make sure that you're how much the fuse we can do a quick area calculation? And then we've got it. So it's in seconds, really. So we've got all this and we can uh, do all those things there. But how we how we sort of engage with that data? So recently I've started working with the HoloLens system and we want to see can we can we create a workflow that goes from the drone right through the HoloLens. So now we can bring the whole site put it on a meeting table in front of us and explore that site. And the thing that really stood out with this is you see, you see I'm pointing into a part of the cliff in a second. Just in there. realized the depth of this little cave system that was, that was in that cliff face, which when it's just on the screen, it's hard to pick out in real detail. But once you put the hollow lens on, you actually get right in there and you can actually get the depth and you can feel that. So we're finally creating more of an engaging environment for how we deal with 3D data. And when I was playing with this, we we're actually now using it as a tool. So um, we recently hosted the press and one of our um, members of parliament. Um, because the site is, is quite high, pro high profile, it's uh, still quite a dangerous site but it's in the press quite often. Um, they want to come and see the progress. So instead of just taking the right straight to site, we, we brought them into the office first and we're able to run them through a whole site induction. Um, so we're able to highlight all these areas and read to say this is going to be unsafe to not go any of them. Uh, we can put them but the whole thing is through everyone and they can run through the whole site and experience it before they even get there. <coughs> so that's, that's bringing static data into the whole thing. It's, but what, what if we can actually integrate it with simulations as well? So I went back to the work that I've done in CFT and I thought, what if I could create the office environment around me? So I found the old 2D auto head plans. I quickly created a 3D model of all the furniture and everything in it. Ran CFT analysis on the area, showing the uh, heating ventilation system. And then put that through the holidays. And now we can actually map out the area and see that air flow around the room in front of us and explore it. So far, everything's been very digital. Um, VR, HoloLens, everything's just a digital, digital experience. Um, what I wanted was more of how do we, how do we go to a tactile experience? How do we actually feel data and design? So, another earthquake example. Um, our geotech medical team was going through, um, they had a court case coming up. Basically, it was around the assessment for the piles after a buildings gone through some lateral movement. So in this case, they, was, they were trying to claim that we should have gone back and checked more piles in this situation. But we wanted to explain that basically that all these piles are connected with the pile pack system, they're all going to act the same way. So they came to me and said, like, 
It's a little hand sketch. You said, how can we create some sort of something that we can take to the judge that to sort of create in layman's terms so that he can understand how it all works. So <coughs> that's seen the work that I did with the art gallery, you know, with the simulators, the visual experience, but we thought, how can we how can we go one step further? So again using fusion, uh, in the 3D printing. I designed and created this system, uh, which that they were throwing the bag, go to the court, and hand it to the judge, and have them put it together. Now, those piles are printed out of rubber material, so when you move everything, you actually get to experience what happens. You get to see the shape of the piles as they move around. Um, and the client just loved this so much that they ordered a bunch of these. Um, and since then, they've been showing up in all sorts of meetings all around, all around the place. So now that we've, we've got this ability to go with tactile experience, uh, and we've also got the ability to capture data with the drone and create real world scenarios, how can we do something similar? So some of you might have seen in the exhibit hall um, there's a what's called an augmented reality sandbox. Um, it's basically some sand with a projector. Xbox Connect scanner that basically calculates the depth of the sand and then reproduces the, uh, the contours over the surface. So, using Fusion, I designed one that could be CNC fabricated out of a single sheet of material and 3D printed the brackets. And then that's the sandbox system in there. So, we wanted a fit set system that you could put together, put in the car, take somewhere. Pull the sand in, put the connector on, put the projector on, and it's a lot. <coughs> so, the problem you have is how do you get the data from the drone into the sandbox? Um, now, the software that runs the sandbox that was developed by Dan Knight, a, a guy named Oliver, um, out of University in San Francisco. It's all open source. Uh, and he's recently created an update that allows you to do basically like a paint by numbers system where you load in the model and it will color the sand to say where to put the sand. But to me, that just seemed a little, a little bit too. Uh, there's no way you're going to be able to really get an accurate layout in that sand. So instead, I thought, how can we automate this whole process? So again, using Fusion, I designed a whole system that's basically like a CNC machine. So this one little bracket. Um, so that's a gantry that runs along on top of the same line. And on the other side, that attaches to a vacuum system. So basically we create a little vacuum robot system. Now we can go from drone to recap to remake into Fusion, and using Fusion's CNC capabilities, we can actually use that to drive this automated system as well. So now we've, we've closed that loop. We're, we're able to go from the drone straight through to the sandbox, have a scale model of that sandbox in the, of the site in the sand. And then we can even project the imagery from the drone back over the sand to actually get the real scale. And then once you've got that model, then you can start interacting with it. So how do we say, right, let's move some sand from this area and therefore see that change. And then the next step is obviously how do we then use that as our design medium. So the 
considered reliable and we can talk to someone that knows how to run CAD products and be able to go through and redesign that site. Instead, the clients can come in, they can just lay in the sand and basically reshape that surface and then have that surface reprojected right through to that simple 3D or Infoworks, uh, which I didn't actually realize that um, that's what they're showing down at the building hall at the moment is that, link, that next step. So I'm in collaboration with them, we're going to tie them together. So. <coughs> So they're, they're two very separate um, systems, really. Um, VR, it, it allows you to put yourself in that environment. Right. Uh, and AR allows you to actually collaborate together in a space. And to all see the yeah. same. Okay. So we've, we've had situations with clients where we've had mm -hmm. four of these set up all at once, brought them all in, we've put a site on a table, and everyone can then collaborate around that site. So if I, if I point at something on that site, you can see me pointing at it. Um, yeah. yeah. Whereas if we're in a VR environment, you can't see what I'm doing. Right. We're all just in this little black box. So, okay. so we're, we're not just using the light, we're, we're still exploring the world. Thank you. 